Hey everyone, I'm Jonathan Kim, one of the hosts of What the Flick. You also may have seen me on The Young Turks, The Huffington Post, The Uprising Radio Show, or on my website RethinkReviews.net. In addition to reviews, I sometimes have the opportunity to interview the people who make or are in the movies, like directors, producers, actors, or the subjects of documentaries. So we here at What the Flick thought we'd start a new segment so you, the What the Flick viewers, could check out those interviews and we have a great one to start off with. A few weeks ago, I had the chance to sit down with Tom Hooper, the director of The King's Speech, which is one of the year's major Oscar contenders, and scored a 9.1 rating on What the Flick. The King's Speech is based on the true story of Prince Albert, played by Colin Firth, who would later become King George VI, but first had to overcome a terrible stammering problem so he could become a world leader in the dawning age of mass communication and help rally England to fight the Nazis. Jeffrey Rush plays Lionel Logue, Albert's unaccredited, unconventional speech therapist, and Helena Bonham Carter plays Albert's wife, Elizabeth. I asked Tom, who also directed The Damn United and HBO's award-winning miniseries on John Adams, about how world leaders have had to change in the age of mass communication and whether that's a good thing, the BBC versus HBO, and a few other things. So I hope you enjoyed this new segment on What the Flick and my interview with the director of The King's Speech, Tom Hooper. Is there a difference between a stutter and a stammer? And or is it a very good well? question. Um, well, s someone in here over in Amer you know, someone in America said that a stammer relates to a block where where you simply can't speak, and a stutter is more repetitive, where you repeat the first letter of a word. Uh, but in my research, I was told they were interchangeable. Um, so the mystery continues. <laughs> I was wondering what what your thoughts were, what you kind of came across in terms of the role of kind of speech and charisma in politics. Well, I, I think it's a, I think it's what's really interesting is I think the coming of radio started this whole theme in leadership of does a leader emotionally connect to his audience. Now, you know, as, as a result of all the soul searching after the midterm elections, you know, pe people, people keep asking that thing of well, does you know is, uh, is Obama connecting emotionally enough to the to the nation when he addresses them effectively when he speaks on camera? Then, and what's interesting is they're not saying is he emotionally connected to the state of the nation. I mean, I think ev I think everyone would agree that he's passionately connected to the issues. It's it's more they're saying when he talks about it on camera, does he does he project that emotional connection sufficiently and in the right way? So it's, so it's actually a question of performance, not content. N no one seems to be questioning that he cares, it's just does he project how much he cares through the way he addresses camera. Now this, this theme about, you know, does a leader connect only started with the coming of mass communications medium and in a way it starts with the coming of our movie where suddenly a king goes from being a visual icon um, and, you know, his role in the iconography of leadership in the monarchy is, pr is pretty much uh, a visual one. I mean, waving from a carriage, sitting on a horse, looking good in uniform, and suddenly um, it becomes, well, does he emotionally connect with us, with the nation, with the, with the people? Um, and, and that requires a certain type of performance uh, on radio. Um, it requires a certain ability to project that you care through your performance. Uh, and, and of course, the irony with King George VI is, you know, not only was there that problem, there was the big problem of could he even get the words out because of, because of his stammer. But the irony with King George VI is, I, from what I understand about reading about accounts of him during the war, is that he, he, you could argue he did more to humanize the monarchy than anyone else because his, his, his stammer was a great leveler. You know, you can't see a king as this impossible uh, figure who's above everyone and, uh, and anointed by God and some kind of superhuman if he can't speak or if he struggles speaking and, and, and I think it did more to emotionally connect people because they listened on the radio and they heard him struggling and it was terribly um, uh, moving to hear that. I guess, I guess uh, another side of that of that question, I guess, is is this a good thing? <laughs> I mean, I mean, in terms of asking politicians to not only be great leaders, but to be sort of, at this point, broadcasters, which are you know, off, I mean, you could say are two really different skills, but at the same time, are great leaders supposed to be able to speak and inspire and rally? But I, I but I think that horse has bolted. I mean, I think the idea that we could unpick that, uh, and leaders could be not great broadcasters has gone. I mean, I think, I think the world's changed forever like that. And if anything, I think the pressure on people to perform well on camera has only intensified because 
you know, video sound recording has become so ubiquitous. I mean, you know, if a if a, a political candidate is any kind of crowd, mm -hmm. you know, any number of people can video them with their iPhones or their phones or their tiny little cameras, mm -hmm. and so so I think we're progressing to an, perhaps another step where life is lived perhaps almost almost always on camera if you're a public figure and e and the step beyond that is you don't even you you can never be quite sure when you are or are not on camera i mean i've noticed you know when i give say an introductory speech introducing the movie you know i look out into the i look out into the semi darkness and i don't know anymore whether i'm being videoed because in the old days there would be a you know, a socking great camera with a red light on, and I think, oh, okay, someone's videoing what I'm saying. But now, it can be completely invisible. So, so we've we've kind of gone from the stage of you know uh, the pre-broadcasting era to the question of does it matter, you know, as a leader, you know, as a leader, you need to be a good broadcaster to a kind of perhaps the next level where you need to be aware that you're possibly on camera in almost any public situation so it, so, so it becomes like reality television where, you're, where your life is lived with the chance of being recorded all the time and therefore your broadcast personality almost has to start merging into your person into your, into your personality every day I mean, you, need, you need to be this person who is on, the, on their guard but also emotionally connected in the way that you, know, that you need to be uh, if you're a political leader so I mean you know I think there's a profound revolution going on at the moment about the ubiquity of recording devices and that's going to again be a game changer. It seems like because of the BBC like England does a lot of these great sort of like real living history sort of pieces and I assume without as much pressure on making big box office and I think the closest thing we have in some ways to that in America is HBO mm. which you did yeah. with John Adams with and I guess I'm, I'm curious w what you think about the the role of, of that sort of living history sort of sort of thing and, and, and also what is that America I mean other than the odd HBO miniseries every mm. once in a while that we don't seem to do it as much yeah I mean I mean Lord Reith who was the founder of the BBC said it, its mandate was to inform educate and entertain and I think in some some ways I've I've grown up with that sense that it's possible to say something about the world and entertain at the same time and that that should be you know that's a great goal as a filmmaker if you can do both and you know I think the success that the King's Speech appears to be happening is, is great because it's, it's it's entertainment but it's also taking you into a you know a story you know a, a story of great political importance in a time in history and, 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 and kind of bringing people in some areas and issues that are very uh, interesting but I, but I think you're right that in in Amazingly, in America, the man, this mantle, the kind of BBC-like mantle, the mantle of the public service broadcaster, seems in some ways to have been adopted most successfully by HBO, which is w amazingly counterintuitive because I mean HBO is a, you know, a ruthlessly commercially driven company and it's made a lot of money for, you know, its parent company Time Warner, but but I feel that HBO has that same aspiration to uh, to do big projects that educate its. Uh, viewership about key aspects of American culture. I mean, they asked me to do John Adams and it was this extraordinary chance to restage the American Revolution through the eyes of John Adams, uh, you know, to go out during the US primaries and, you know, there was not much else being made in 2008 that was about uh, the, the origin of American political values and, you know, and here I was engaged on this extraordinary Opportunity to say, you know, to, to look at whether it was possible to trace, you know, to trace the origin of this extraordinary schism in American political values that we still, that we're absolutely living with. I mean, it's a country in many ways politically divided against itself. To say, is it possible to trace the origin of that schism in values back to the personalities of the founders? You know, to see I I in the creation story of the country, can you see these two themes open up? And you absolutely can. And so. You know, I felt it was startlingly relevant to tell the story of um, the American Revolution during 2008 because it was still so incredibly, it was still such an incredibly vivid and relevant prism to look at current po politics through. Um, you know, and then you've got shows like The Wire, which is an attempt over 70, 80 hours to, an, to in detail anatomize the overlapping intricacies corruptions, power struggles of a, of a, of a, of a modern, you know, 
uh, American city in decline. Um, and the, the ambition and the detail, it's almost like a great documentary series in terms of um, how, they, how they created you know, and looked at all these sub-communities that make up the broader community of uh, Baltimore. And you know, so it's very, um, I think what HBO is doing in a way is, is taking on the BBC's mantle, but what's exciting is that it's doing it in a commercial environment because you know, you kind of grow up thinking if, if it's commercial then it's going to be dumbed down and HBO seems to have contradicted this. And I think you know, coming to the King's Speech, I mean, one of the things that gave me confidence about the fact that there was an audience for it in America was my HBO work. Where, you know, work for HBO, I was never told to dumb anything down. I was never. Uh, they, they assume their audience is clever, and they assume there's a big clever audience out there, which there is. And so I made King Speech in a way for that same, you know, very large, smart audience. And um, um, I think it's, you know, I much prefer assuming that my audience is bright and engaged than the reverse. And 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 I think that the HBO work gave me confidence that you can approach it like that. You know, I, I was reading an, an interview where you mentioned that, I guess in the original play, that there isn't that much talk about their friendship or something. No, no, no. It's, uh, it's um, I think, one of the things I brought to it, and it took me, you know, a lot of thinking about it, was that in the end, I, I felt that the thing that saves him in the final hour is the friendship. And I think the script I started with, it was a, it was a it was slightly more biased towards the therapy but the script I started with had had um, uh, the king cured in the final speech so he you know he he, he, he was stammer free he, he and I, I felt that a lot of films about disability talk about this idea of the miracle cure and I think the reality of most disabilities is about it's about learning to live with it it's, it's about making accommodations to it. it the miracle cure is a very unusual scenario and on top of that I heard the actual you can hear the actual broadcast and this guy is not he's not stammer free he's learned to cope with it beautifully he's learned to incorporate the pauses um, into a kind of nice dramatic rhythm that actually gives it um, power and strength um, so once you once you kind of take on this idea that he's not going to be cured you're then going to say well what you know what makes him safe in that room what makes him able to perform it well and and uh, it was actually during the edit that I began to think, no, no, no. I think it's, I think it's, I think it's the friendship that saves him. And so I began to re recut it to, to make sure this this idea that um, friendship was important was was key. In this line, when Logue says, "Forget everyone else and say it to me, say it to me as a friend," that 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 to me is the key line in the movie. In other words, he, he's just kind of saying. Um, if you can forget the terror of the mass audience and just realize you have a friend in the room and it's me that's going to relax you and that's that's in the end the, 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 you know what what saves Bertie in this incredibly dramatic moment I was, I was curious about um, when you got a hold of, of Logue's diary mm. um, what came out of that that um, that um, maybe you hadn't seen stripper that kind of amazed you I felt and there was first of all some great moments of dialogue. So at the end of the um, at the end of the big speech in the movie, uh, Lionel Logue turns to the king and says, "You still stammered on the W." And the king says, "Well, I had to throw in a few, so they knew it was me." Now that's a th th those lines were actually written by King George VI and Lionel Logue, and they're in the diaries. Um, and it was uh, what was great about that is not only does it does it give me two lines that get you know, a huge laugh in any audience where I play it, whether it's London or New York or LA or Canada. It it's also gives you great insight into the wit of King George VI. It was a man who could say that is funny and self-deprecating and smart. And some historians, because I think Bertie had a stammer, were rather tough on him and said he was the, sl you know, the slow, dull-witted one. And the diaries made me realise that, no, this guy um, has not only got a good brain, but he's got a great wit. And so it, it, it gave us confidence to search out more places of wit in the script, but it also, um, you know, where, where David had instinctively used humour, it confirmed his his hunch that there was a, there was a humorous, witty relationship between these two men. Yeah, the the, the line of, I mean, it's in the trailer also, obviously. The um, you know, can you tell a joke, and he says, "Well, timing isn't." The yeah, <laughs> and that was in a, you know, that was the timing. Uh, I, I think David had in his script, you know, do you know any jokes? But I think Colin 
came up with this this response of timing isn't my strong suit and that and I think again it was Co Colin was confident to find that wit because the diaries were confirming that the king, the king had this wit um, and and I th you know and I then I think the other thing is just uh, you know, I mean, another good example from the from the diary, we learned the famous photograph from the 3rd of September 1939 of the king at his grand desk with his grand microphones in this grand room with his naval uniform sitting sitting and reading the speech. It's a fake. From the diaries, we learned that he did it in a funny little back room, decorated cheerfully by Logue at an old school desk that Logue had found in the basement, which he hammered wooden legs into to raise it up. And that the king spoke standing up with the window open, with his jacket off, with Logue one-on-one -on -one in the room. And, um, and that was uh, um, terrifically exciting to, 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 to discover that this, this, you know, because normally you take that photo and go, well, that's our starting point. We have a photograph of him making a speech and through the diaries. We know it's propaganda. Um, so uh, the, the diaries were also he helpful, not just dialogue and character, but with some great physical details. Um, which I found, and, and you know, the diaries also described how when Logue travels to the palace on the outbreak of war, the country is in a high state of readiness for war, which I hadn't realised. I mean, I thought it would be, it would catch up, but no, the sandbags are out. The back, he describes the barrage balloons in the air. Um, you know, the country is ready for an air raid, and then there is an air raid. You know, there's an air raid on day one of the war. I mean, who? They, 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 and, uh, who I mean, I never knew that. It's a, you know, someone even asked me recently, did I make that up? But no, that's all true. It's in the diaries. Um, can you think of movies that you've seen in your life that that sort of, I guess, changed the way you look at the world, or changed your, mm. or changed your life that were big in your life? Yes, I mean, one of the great uh, privileges of of taking this film. Um, into the festivals was to was to meet Peter Weir in Telluride, who is you know really one of my childhood heroes, and um, you know as a half Australian, half English filmmaker, my, my mother w would say you know look at what the Australian filmmakers are doing, and it was Peter Weir, it was Bruce Ferris, but it was George Miller, it was Fred Skepsy, it was that there's a wonderful generation of Australian filmmakers that I that I educated myself about, and of that group, I think Peter's had a profound influence because if you look at you know, a film like Gallipoli. I mean, I think it, it's one of the great period movies because it's it's so emotional. You know, it's it, it it brings the reality of that war into such a vivid present tense, and it's so and he 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 comes up with very great imagery through powerful research, and it's in many ways the tool I I use is I it's through research I come up with I hope more original imagery and and, and subvert some of the cliches of a, of a of a period, and then Master and Commander I think was one of the you know, along with Barry Lyndon, I think to me that the, if you ask, you know, if you ask, say, what influenced John Adams, you know, Master and Commander and Barry Lyndon were the two, just by Kubrick, the two were the two great influences. Uh, but there, I mean, there are many, you know, film, wonderful filmmakers. I mean, I was in the Governor's Awards last night, and they were honouring Francis Ford Coppola, and you know, he he was, he, he, in terms of teenage heroes, you know. Coppola had an extraordinary effect on me, and it was that we saw this clip reel before Francis spoke, and it was such, you know, such a powerful reminder of what those images did to my teenage filmmaking brain.